Good morning. Happy Sabbath. I want to wish you a warm happy Sabbath. We are in the time of the year where unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on the side of the coin you look on, it is getting colder every week. So a warm welcome to you this morning here in the church and as you're watching online and shortly over the airwaves. We have a number of announcements. I'd like to invite Mr. Mark Beardsley up here at this time. Good morning, church family. I would like to call your attention to this announcement that's in your bulletin. Pathfinders this year, we are not gonna be going door to door collecting non-perishable food items. We are asking our church family to please help support needy families in our community. So today, we are going to be passing out bags at the different doors around the church. So we'd ask each of you to take a bag if one is not enough, please feel free to use more bags that you can bring on your own or boxes. We have a box that's in the back corner of the church if you guys are able to bring items either next week or the following week, but the 14th is when we're hoping to have everything collected. So again, please, non-perishable food items that you can donate to help needy families. Take a bag at the end of the service and then also bring that back either next week or on the 14th. So thank you all for your help. I want to wish you all a happy Sabbath, but also a happy Reformation Day. It has been 503 years as of today since Martin Luther nailed those important theses to the door. How many here have read those 95 theses? We have a few of you who have. I have not, and it just occurred to me while I'm standing here I should go read them this afternoon because I'm sure that I would learn a ton by doing that. Um, how many of you have started your reading challenge? Several of you have. Guess what? We have somebody who's already finished their first 10 books. So congratulations to them, and we can all be inspired to keep at it, and they have their prize. So we're going to, I just wanted to highlight Reformation Day because we have a few books in the library that you might be interested in on that topic. One is a book for children about Martin Luther himself, and um, it's available to check out. Another one, it's called Martin Luther, the Great Reformer, so a pretty obvious title on that one. Another book that might be of interest, which I have read many years ago, is called Home to Our Valleys, and it's about... Um, the Waldenses or the Vaudois, it's kind of a, um, it says on the back, it is a history of the glorious return of the Vaudois to their valleys where one sees a troop of these folks who never numbered as many as a thousand. And they carry on a war um, to protect their people and their beliefs, and it's a very interesting read. We also have another one that's very new, and so it's not on the shelf yet, but if you're interested in it, you can talk to me after church, and I'll get you set up with it. And it is called The History of the Walden Seas, and um, it's been highly recommended to me as well, so it's a new one for our collection. And of course, what is the book that we're all familiar with that would help us learn a lot about the Re Reformation or review a lot about the Reformation? Great controversy. So let's all take maybe a chapter or two or just listen or read to the whole, listen to or read the whole book and um, just really find ourselves inspired by the faith of these people who are willing to go um, to the prison and even to death for their faith. And let's, let's review these things to help ourselves prepare for the second coming that we know is even sooner now. Yes. If someone wanted a bookmark and didn't get one, where would you The bookmarks, you can find one at the library or straight out the back on the podium where they keep the bulletins and things like that as well. So if you can't find one, come talk to one of us and we'll point you in the right direction. Amen. 
I have two announcements. I just want one to bring your attention to in the bulletin. It says cantata. We are going to perform it this year. We're be coming up with some creative, safe ways to do so. I have the books and CDs in the something else room. So if you want to participate um, after church, please come in there, and I will give those to you. Um, next, I have, and I'm gonna, yeah, there we go. There's the first picture. Cedar Lake SDA Church Feeding America Food Distribution. We did it. 10, 27, 20. People fed, 170. People helping, 56. Here's a few pictures. Um, we had Katie in charge of the intake and uh, greeting people. Jasmine was helping. And Dave was one of the, the people to talk to people along with Steve Roderick. I'm not going to be able to give everybody's names because you saw it was 56. But um, so I'm just going to let the pictures speak a thousand words and click through. <laughs> uh, all the boxes that we taped back together to put the food in. Not we, Dave and his team, Dave Carter. Uh, there's the feeding truck, uh, the Feeding America truck. And do you recognize the, the, the lady running the forklift? Cindy Voss, yes, she, she ran the forklift for us. We were, we were impressed with her skills and impressed that they had a forklift we could use. <laughs> Some of the produce that uh, we, were, we gave away, it was in, a unique, I guess, this time. The only thing they gave us were fruits and vegetables and fruit juice. Um, so uh, there were no boxes, bags, or cans. Well, there were bags, but <laughs> potatoes. Um, peppers, all sorts of uh, peppers. And then this is Matt and uh, Nancy Cox um, working hard to figure out the math as to how many to give each family, uh, Delwyn assisting, and I even see Dave in the background. Oopsies. There we go. Um, some other people helping to figure it out. Uh, we, we discovered that we needed two boxes because we were giving so much food to everybody. So each family got two big boxes of food. Um, there's, I, now that looks like a gloss student, am I correct? Yeah, yeah. all right, Seth, thank you. There's, there's quite a, uh, we had several gloss students, I think uh, six or so that were helping. My clicker doesn't want to click. Is there a certain place to point it? I guess that was a sweet spot. <laughs> Some more Gloss students helping us out. And uh, I think the gentleman on the left is actually from the Lions Club. He, they were some helpers from there also. And there's Mary Beth and others in the background. And getting all the food together and, oh, that was the end. That's our, that's our last picture. There's a lot more pictures. Um, thank you, Beth Wallace, for taking them. Um, they'll be, I think she's putting them on Facebook. Um, but uh, it was very, very successful. Um, we had to send stats to Feeding America to tell them what we had done. Uh, Juanita and Lynn, I saw a picture of you guys, and I knew who you were. I just didn't say it. <laughs> Would you guys mind, in, in this congregation and in at, at GLA, everyone that helped with Feeding America, would you please stand up? In this congregation and at GLA, please stand up. I just want to thank you so very, yes, uh, all of you that helped, yes. Uh, we really, uh, we had just a great group of volunteers. Thank you, you may be seated. And thank you, the Gloss students. I, I couldn't see you, but I knew you stood, because we asked you to. Um, we had to send in a Feeding America feedback form. We gave away 51 boxes of food to people. 51 families were blessed because of this food distribution. Um, it, it turns out to be 170 people as we added up on the sheet. 63 of them were senior citizens, 27 were children, and even five were veterans. Um, we were truly blessed. Uh, looking forward to doing it again in the future. Uh, looking forward to having more uh, people know where the Cedar Lake Church is so they know where to come to get the food. And just so grateful for all the help. Thank you so very much, volunteers. And if you did not get your t-shirt, we have an Acts of Kindness t-shirt that uh, we had for everybody. Please come to the Something Else After Church and I'll get, make sure you get your t-shirt. Thank you.
Thank you, Nancy. And yes, what a joy that was to be God's hands and feet Tuesday evening. Call to worship this morning comes from Romans 12, verse 2. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And the follow-up steps to Christ, page 43. The whole heart must be yielded to God, or the change can never be wrought in us, which we are to be restored to his likeness. By nature, we are alienated from God. God desires to heal us, to set us free. But since this requires an entire transformation, a renewing of our whole nature, we must yield ourselves wholly to him. Let's prepare our hearts this morning. God of wonders, Heavenly Father, great God Almighty, this is the day that you have called your people together. We are here. We ask, Father, that you will have your way, that you will provide grace, that you will give us comfort and you will give us strength. You will bring conviction to our hearts and we will respond in repentance. Lord, that you would provide for your people and your people would respond. And Father, we ask for your blessing. Not only that, Lord, we ask that our hearts would desire and want to receive your blessing. So thank you, Father, for caring. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. singing our first song of praise, hymn number 108, Amazing Grace.
Our next song of praise is number 432, Shall We Gather at the River? is singing our opening song, I'll Hail the Power of Jesus' Name, number 229. Please stand.
Thank you. You may be seated. I don't know if you would remember this, but back in May, we had an offering for evangelism. And as it turned out, I'm leading both calls for evangelism. There's just two of them this year. And I told you to remember and put away some extra money for evangelism for October 31st. So if you forgot, you can go to uh, our online giving, which is up on the screen, and you can do that after sundown. So today's offering is for evangelism in all its phases in Michigan. From the public proclamation of the three angels' message through unlock revelation and Jesus on prophecy, to individual witnessing through personal ministries, to church training at Emmanuel Institute, campus ministry to secular universities, children's ministries through VBS, and more. Each program is able to continue only as you respond to God's invitation to support them through your offerings. When you give to evangelism, you support the sharing of the everlasting gospel across both Michigan and your local community. God continues to move across Michigan with hundreds of lives being transformed each year. Don't be satisfied with merely supporting evangelism by financially. Put your church on the map spiritually through being a light in your community. Get connected. Be willing to step out in faith and share Christ with your inner circle of influence. Being a ministry that will influence your neighbors for Christ. Start a prayer or Bible study group at your workplace or home. When we seek to labor for souls around us, our hearts will develop a deeper, growing love for Christ and those we know and don't know that they, that they might also experience the salvation that he has given to us. As you support MAP through this evangelism offering, God is using your dollars to work miracles in the lives of those who haven't heard of his wonderful love for them. But don't let God only use your dollars because he wants to use you. And we have this initiative, Cedar Lake Cares, here in Cedar Lake. Begin praying today and ask him how your response to his call, both financially and personally, can be used for his glory. Offering will be collected on the four boxes on the back pillars in the sanctuary, online, or you can mail in your offering as well. Let's pray for the offering gathered. Father in heaven, it is a joy to give back the blessing that you've poured out upon us. Lord, please be with this money and bless it as, we, as it is gathered to do your work. Please reach as many hearts as you can with this money collected, and may people know who we are in our community. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. It is now time for our children's story. The children will be coming up here and sitting on the steps. They will not be collecting the offering. The offering will be collected at the end of the church service at the doors. And today's story is held by Dina Norcross. Good morning. How are you this beautiful, sunny Sabbath day? Good? You know, it's kind of nice, I have to say, to see you all here together. I like that. Do you like that? Yeah? yeah? All right. Well, today I brought a bag with me. And in this bag, there are some things that need to be put back in their place where they belong. These are some things that they might not all look the same, 
but they help us with the same thing, to do something. You want to guess what it is? Yeah? Maybe it could be um, a broken tiny broom or something. Okay. It's a good guess. Anybody else wants to guess? Yeah? Silverware. Well, it kind of sounds like it, doesn't it? I think you got it. Let's see what's in here. I have a spoon, right? A knife. I have, what are these? Yeah. Forks, and they're different sizes, huh? Are they, are they all the same? No. No. What do they help us with? Yeah. Eating. Eating, yes. Help us to eat. Now, if we were to have some soup, could this help us? No. No. What about this one here? No. No. What? What do I need? I need the spoon. They all have a different job to do, don't they? Yeah, you really want the spoon to have your soup. Um, you know that we are just like that silverware. We all have jobs to do, things that we're very good at. Over there, too. We all have things that we're good at, and we have jobs to do. And you know what else I have here? You know what this is? No. Yeah. What is this? It kind of does, but it doesn't have any holes in it. Yeah? Yeah. You know, this is for our silverware, to put our silverware in. It has the compartments to help us. So we have a bigger one and a smaller one. See? And so you can keep them all there. And they belong there. Do you know that that tray is, is kind of like our church? And we belong here. And we all have different jobs to do. And we want to fit in there. Do you know, um, have you ever been in school maybe, maybe not the school you go to, but kids are playing together and they don't want one of those kids to come and play and keep that kid out. And you're all playing, but you don't play with that one. Is that kid part of the school family? Amen. Yeah. Are you all part of the church family? Yeah. And you know, there's some kids that may not look exactly like you, but they're part of the human family too. They might not be part of this one. And what would our job be? Do you think God has a job for us to do? Can you be a peacemaker and maybe that kid that is standing by himself or by herself just needs someone to come and say, come play with us. Come be with us. Or maybe at the academy, somebody's sitting alone somewhere. And maybe it's a turn for someone else to with us. Can we sit together? Wouldn't that be nice? We all have a job to do, and you have a job to do that nobody else can do, just you. So let's pray this morning that God will help us to be useful, right? To be part of that group that we all belong together. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord, that you made us your children, and we belong all together. I pray that you'll help us 
to find those that are out, that may be feeling like not fitting in, and to include them. In Jesus' name, amen. time now for our family prayer time. As we are able, let us all kneel together. Father in heaven, Lord, what a beautiful Sabbath morning you've given to us. What a joy and privilege it is to meet in your house this morning. Lord, this time of year we see all the colors of the, on the trees, the leaves that are changing. Lord, they're so beautiful. But Lord, help us to remember that if Adam were here, he would be heartbroken. Let these leaves remind us that we also need change in our hearts. So, Lord, please change our hearts this morning. Lord, all of us who are here are sinners. We are all in need of some sort of healing, physical, mental, spiritual. But, Lord, we have some members in our congregation that we'd like to lift up to you this morning in special prayer. We want to lift up Rick Carver, Sohela Gulick, Barb Rogers, Jean Largis, Scott Fellows, Barbara Moshko, Isla Collins' sister Brenda, Irma Breen, David Stevenson. Lord, there are others who are not on this list that are near and dear to our hearts. I'm going to pause at this time as we lift them up to you. Father, we thank you for hearing our prayers and we thank you for your action. We trust that you will answer these prayers in your own time, in your own way. Lord, we thank you for the promise of your Holy Spirit. And may nothing come between us where we wouldn't receive your spirit this morning. Lord, I want to lift up Pastor Gibbs and ask that you anoint him as you speak through him to us. May our hearts be open to what you have to say and may we hear something that will want us to change to be more like Jesus. We thank you again for your Sabbath. May all the honor and glory go to you, but leave us your Sabbath blessing this morning, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, Glaw and Church family. Uh, our scripture reading today will be found in Revelation 1, 17 through 18. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, but he laid his right hand on me, saying to me, do not be afraid, I am the first and the last. 
I am he who lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of Hades and of death. This good? This is okay. back tired I wonder why um, what verse is on the screen Philippians chapter 5 chapter 3 4 verse what verse what which verse Philippians chapter 4 and verse 5. Let's get a, let's get a confirmation. Who has that confirmation for me? All right, good. Philippians verse 4 and 6. 4 verse 6. It says, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God. I'm very thankful this week. And so I have a few pictures of why I'm thankful. And so you're going to be putting up with this all the time. And, uh, yesterday, she's the best. There's my devotions on your left. So I get up. My wife has already been up. And she says, I need to sleep. So I get, I get that bundle of love, and I read my devotions. And... Um, so far, so good. So far, so good. Yeah. 
She has some funny and unique postures, doesn't she? This is from a baby eye view at her first doctor's appointment. And she's looking up at the best mommy in the world. Now, some of you may be like, what, what, what's going on? Well, there's a lot of best mommies in the world. Amen? It's all from the baby eye view. But from a little Eva, best mommy view. There's two best grandmas in the world in her life. But look at that yawn. That's impressive. So I think there was a clerical error on Pastor Gibbs' part, the scripture reading. Everything got switched around last week. I don't know why. So, so let's, let's forgive Pastor Gibbs and read the scripture reading together. So let's turn to Revelation chapter 1 and we'll read it. Verse 12 through 17. Revelation 12 and Revelation chapter 1 and verse 12 through 17. Then I turned to see the voice that spoke with me. And having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with garments, a garment down to his feet, and girded about the chest with a golden band. His head and hair were like, or white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes like a flame of fire. His feet were like fine brass, as if refined in the furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. He had in his right hand seven stars. Out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was like the sun shining in its strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying, saying to me, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. John sitting or standing on the island of Patmos, hears this voice, turns around and sees where that voice is coming from. What a revelation of Jesus that must have been. We are looking at these seven S's in Revelation chapter 1. We are going through, we looked at Scripture and we looked at we looked at salvation and, and the Savior. We looked at the Sabbath and second coming. And now we're at the sanctuary. If you have my notes, you can see the tent, the sanctuary tent. And then it was upgraded to a temple. And the theme for this sermon is, yes, the sanctuary, but also adjustments. I think to adjust is to be human. When I was a pastor in Lansing, there's, it's different than being a pastor in Cedar Lake. Because when you're in Lansing, you have many different options for a grocery store. Here, they made it simple. They got, they got rid of one, and we have, we have a health food store, and we have a, a grocery store. Uh, maybe you would, you would say the health food store is a grocery store. I don't know. But we have about two options. And we have the Dollar General, if you want to buy those things. But in Lansing, they have a lot. And I, I, I drifted towards Kroger for some reason or another. And when I was a, a faithful shopper at Kroger, they had an, I don't know, an upgrade or whatever. And they started to change the store around because they started to redo everything. And in the redoing of everything... They moved the dairy over here and they moved the produce over there and they moved the bread over here. And my wife gives me a list. And I have learned that when I buy things that are not on the list, there's conversations that happen when I get home. I'm learning to buy more things on the list than not. One time she sent me with a list when we first got married and I bought everything that was not on the list. And she's like, I gave you, and that was 
a learning experience for Pastor Gibbs. And so, on the list was Tofuti cream cheese. Our ancestors were hunter-gatherers. You know, the Native Americans, they hunted and they gathered and they got their food and it took time. Our pioneers, they, they got to this place, our pilgrim fathers, and they, they planted, they hunted, they gathered, and it took time. I never would have thought 30 minutes to hunt for tofu and cream cheese in the grocery store. Every time I went to Kroger, I had to make adjustments because they kept, they didn't, every week it was like a new adjustment. Some adjustments are annoying, like when grocery stores change. Sometimes adjustments are sad. When loved ones pass, we, we have to learn to, to adjust to that seat that's been occupied so long by dad or spouse or so-and-so is now empty. Sometimes to be human means to adjust. Sometimes they're sad. And sometimes adjustments are happy. Sometimes when, when the baby cries at night, uh, two nights ago, it was like, I close my eyes, then I open them without any passage of time, it seems like, with the baby saying, help me in a wambulance tone. And then I close my eyes again once we got her calm, and she's a beautiful baby. She's wonderful because she like quiets down relatively soon after her needs are met. Oh, my, and then it happens again. And last night, my wife likes to tag team on diaper changes because she's a kicker. And we learned that sometimes when you kick, you kick the, the diaper spot that you don't want them to kick, and then it's all fun and games after that. And so, but it's, it's these adjustments are so fun. Even though I'm really tired right now, it's so worth it. Some adjustments are extremely joyful. Some adjustments we don't want to make. You know, the belt notches? We don't want to make those adjustments because then we have to face the stark reality that we're gaining a wider influence in this world. <laughs> so some adjustments, they're annoying, some are sad, some are happy, and some we just don't want to face. We try to, we try to hang in there, we try to hang in there, there's a, there's a saying that uh, Don McIntosh says um, about snacks, big snacks. The bigger the snacks, the bigger the slacks. <laughs> so Dan, my, uh, I think we learned that. What, that was the Daniel Health program that we did. That's where I learned that. And I haven't been doing much, uh, <laughs> any kind of walking or any kind of exercise this last week. And Hopefully, adjustments don't need to be made. But in church, did you know that to be Christian means to adjust? Did you know that? Think about the adjustments that happened over the past 2,000 years. I mean, yeah, right when Jesus came to the scene, big adjustments happened for the people of God. Whole sacrifice service that kind of went bye bye and then Pentecost happened, and whoa, adjustments. And then, then you fast forward two decades to the 300s, or, or centuries, two, de two centuries, and you fast forward, and, and you, you get to the kind of the popular era of the church. Emperor Constantine, he becomes Christian, and all of a sudden, what used to be persecuted, what used to be pushed down, what used to be suppressed is now popular. And the faithful had to make adjustments because if they just rode the popular wave, they started to realize that their Christianity was becoming watered down. And if you, 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 you realize the watered down Christianity just didn't happen at 300, but at successful centuries afterwards, the faithful constantly needed to make adjustments to the heresies that were creeping into the Christian era. And we get to the 1500s, which was noted during the announcement time today, 
503 years ago, a big adjustment had to take place. The faithful had to pay attention to the words spoken by Martin Luther. Big adjustments took place in Christianity in 1517. And then in the 1800s, several men, one will name is William Miller, he started preaching about the soon coming of Jesus Christ, which changed the vocabulary of how Christians talked. Before that, they didn't really focus in on the second coming. Changing the vocabulary that Jesus, all things are right for him to come back. And that started to change the vocabulary for the last 150 years. Adjustments today as a Christian, as a human. 2020, there's been a lot of adjustments. A lot of adjustments. To be human means to adjust. To be Christian means to adjust. And I believe Jesus is with us through all the adjustments. So let's turn to Revelation chapter 1. We see Jesus, he, 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 walks, he walks in on, on this platform of Patmos, 95 A.D. Jesus just 60 years before made a promise in Matthew. You know this promise. You know, it's, it's in the notes, but you don't need to turn there. The last promise in the book of Matthew says what to the believers? I will be with you always. He will be with us at every adjustment that we have to make to remain faithful. Every adjustment. He will be there for us. A big adjustment for those who love Jesus. For those who love the things that Jesus loves in 70 AD. A big adjustment happened. There's a, there's a general named Titus. He came into the area for years, the Jews have been rebelling against the Romans. They've been, they've been killing Roman soldiers, and the, and the Romans got sick of this. And so they, they, they put a siege around Jerusalem. And they went, there's three walls. And it took them time. They had, they had huge instruments to break down the walls and battering rams and huge catapults. And, and they, they're, just, they're, they're just breaking down the wall. They get through the first wall. They get through the second wall. They get to, through the third wall. Everybody retreats to the temple. The, the general, he didn't, want, he didn't want them to, to destroy the temple because, you know why he didn't want them to destroy the temple? Because there's a lot of gold in there, a lot of silver, a lot of riches, and he wanted to take all that. But the Roman soldiers were so angry at this Jewish rebellion who was who was picking off the Roman soldiers like guerrilla warfare. They got so angry that they just annihilated the building and everyone inside. But if you read in Luke 21, verse 5, let's turn there. We'll go back to Revelation. Luke 21, verse 5. This is the same chapter of, as Matthew, 20, or Matthew 24 and Mark 13, but we're in Luke 21, verse 5. Then as he spoke of the temple, how it was adorned with beautiful stones and, and donations, he said, these things which you see, the days will come in which not one stone shall be left upon another that shall not be thrown down. This building was beautiful. The disciples, when they looked at the, you know, in the morning, they look at the temple, that was their pride and joy. That was the center of worship. That was the center of the, of the activity of the church in Jerusalem. This was the place. Now it's destroyed. Adjustments. How do we, how do we function? How do we do church? Where do we, where do we center ourselves? Adjustments had to be made after Jerusalem was, was sacked by the Romans and this temple destroyed. 
Let's go to Hebrews. Hebrews was written actually before the temple was destroyed. Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse, I think we have 19 and 20. Our best knowledge is that Hebrews was written by Paul, and Paul was um, martyred before 70 AD. In verse 19, Paul, he kind of, he grasps this point that there's something better than the earthly temple. He kind of, he gets it. He's communicating. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. I love this passage. But the part that we're bringing out is Paul was saying, there's not, we're not going by the old way. There's a new and living way. And he goes into this in this chapter. He says, there's, there's a temple in heaven and, and there's a high priest and there's wonderful things that happen. But they, I think God needed to answer a vital question. What is this new and living way all about? So Jesus in Revelation 1 does something that everybody in Mrs. Williams' class loves to do. Everybody, I, I come on Friday, and I come in the, you know, sometimes I come in the afternoon right after lunch, and, and we, do, we do maybe the second best thing. I teach art. But they love this thing that's called, what is it called? Friday Show and tell. Oh, yeah, that's right. Show and tell. Even big boys with their big toys play that, too. When they get their big toy, they call the big boys around to show them that, you know, we, we, we always play show and tell. We never get rid of it. We don't. It's just sometimes it has wheels, or sometimes it has lead, or sometimes it does this and does that, or has a tractor or whatever. We, we love show and tell. Because we love these things. And Jesus loves show and tell too. He does. And so he understood that Paul, he talked about it, but he wanted to play show and tell with his, his sanctuary in heaven, and that's where Revelation takes place. Revelation's all about show and tell, about the sanctuary. And so he, what does he do? Let's go to Revelation 1. Let's read it. Revelation chapter 1. Last time... Last time John saw Jesus, he saw him in the, the normal way. This time, this time when John sees Jesus, we read it already on our scripture reading, he recognized that voice. He recognized that voice and, he, and he, he turned around to see that voice and in his mind, in his mind, he was thinking he was going to see Jesus. Maybe like he, he saw in the glorified form, but he didn't, maybe not this picture of Jesus. In verse 12, Then I turned to see the voice that spoke with me, and having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to his feet and girded about the chest with a golden band. That is high priest language. We have, we have him in the midst of, of the candlesticks or the lampstands. We have him with, the, with the, the robe of the high priest. His head and his hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like fine brass, if, as if refined in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. He had seven stars in his hand. And John's just blown away at seeing Jesus as high priest. What Jesus is telling us, there was a transition, there was an adjustment that needed to be made for the Christians in that first century. They were so used to centering their, their, their focus on earth. But Jesus wanted to play show and tell with them and say there's, some, there's a better place to focus. There's a better place to focus and, and he, he invites them to look a little higher he invites them. And it must have been difficult 
Think about your pride and joy was destroyed. How difficult that must have been. Jesus met them. And he helped them to adjust. Are you adjusting? What are the hard things that you need to adjust to in 2020? What are some of the difficult things? You might be in transition. Jesus promises, I'll be with you always. He'll be with you. What if your health is, are you struggling in the health realm of life? You get the blood work back. Adjustments. Jesus will be with you during those adjustments. Family dynamics and struggles and personality conflicts, and you have to face them. Jesus will be with you in those adjustments. Homework assignments, that homework assignment that you need to take care of, Jesus will be with you during that adjustment. Let's read Psalm 46 in verse 1, speaking about how Jesus is with us. Psalm 46 in verse 1. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. He appeared to John because he wanted to be with the church during this transition. So looking at this, this show and tell aspect, there's something I discovered about Revelation and the sanctuary. Do I have it with me? Do you know what this is? What is this? What's in this? Okay, say it again. There's information. There's, there's, and what's this right here, this part? It says, our church and worship, what do we call this? The church service, this is the program. Have you ever wondered what the program looked like in Jesus' day at the temple? Did they have bulletins? Did they have a liturgy? They had a liturgy. They did. They actually had a liturgy. A liturgy, this is our liturgy. We start with a call to worship, and we go into the, the prayer of invocation. We do an opening song. Of, this, is, this is, it's called liturgy. It's, it's, a, it's a flow of worship. What was the liturgy that John grew up with? The liturgy that John grew up with, it started this way. This is, this is actually taken from the second temple. The second temple is the one that was rebuilt after Babylon destroyed it. This is the second temple time between, between the Nehemiah to the Romans destroying it in 70 AD, that second temple. And they had a liturgy. And this is what John knew. This is what he grew up with. So the, the priests and the religious observers, the first thing the priest would do in the morning, first thing he would do in the morning, he would go into the temple and he would, he would light the lampstand. That was the first thing you would do. So if we, if we did that, it would, be, it would be a deacon or an elder or the pastor would come in and we would light the candles before anybody is in here. They would, they would turn the lights on. And then, and the next thing that they would do is they would open the great doors so worship could begin. And then they would, they would receive the morning offering. They would, they would kill the lamb. And then they would collect the blood and administer the blood. And then they would apply the incense to the altar. It would be, remember, remember with the, the announcement of John the Baptist? That was part of the daily service. And they would apply the incense. And that's when the dad learned that he was going to be a dad, disbelieved, and doubted. So when my wife told me she was pregnant, I didn't want to doubt. And then after the incense was, was and it was the time of offering, or the time of the incense offering, there was silence. They would, they would have a break in singing. And then the trumpets would sound, and that would signify 
that the lamb was offered and accepted. That was the daily service. And if you know Revelation just a tidbit, you understand that the flow of Revelation chapters 1 through 8 follows the daily service to the T. It, Revelation chapter 1, the very first sanctuary scene in Revelation. Who's there with the lampstands? Who's trimming the lamps of the lampstands? Christ is. Revelation 4, there's a door opened. Then you have then you have Revelation 5, 6, you have the lamb as though it had been slain. Then you have the blood being applied to the altar of incense in Revelation 6, verse 9. Then you have the in altar of incense in Revelation 8. You have there's silence in heaven in Revelation 8. And then you have the trumpets in Revelation 8. What John was doing was saying, what we did down here, I'm doing every day for the church. I'm doing, I'm, I'm, I'm lighting those candles. I'm opening the door so that whoever wants to come and see me, whoever wants to come and experience salvation, you're free to come to the house of God. You're free to come by the boldness that we can enter the house of God, the throne of grace. And we can accept Jesus Christ as a lamb slain from the foundation of the world. And then he he applies the meaning and the force of the blood on behalf of those who want it. Forgiveness, cleansing, sanctification, all of that is applied by the blood of, blood of God, blood of the Son of God. And then he intercedes on the prayers that are lifted up. There's an awe factor when we're just awed by God and we can't say much. And then there's a celebration with the trumpets. It's accepted. You know what's interesting? Daniel 8, chapter 12. In the midst of this time, prophecy and the prophecy of different kingdoms and there's that little horn power in verse 12. It says that little horn power, because of transgression, the Antichrist is another, another term for it, because of transgression, an army was given over to the horn to oppose the daily. And then the word sacrifices is, is um, supplied there. The word daily, it's the same idea of what we just talked about, that, that, that flow of worship. Starting off with, with the, the lights and the open the door and the lamb and, and the prayers of the incense. It says that the Antichrist opposes the daily and casts truth down to the ground. So, so through, the, through the, the ages of Christianity, he didn't stop Jesus from doing the daily because the Antichrist is on earth. How could you stop? How could you stop Jesus when you can't go to heaven? So how do you oppose the daily? The daily is the ministration of Jesus that we see in the book of Revelation being a light to the world, opening the door for all to worship, applying the death of the lamb and applying the lamb to the account of people, the prayers of the saints through incense. How does how does how does the antichrist on earth stop or oppose Jesus in heaven? How does he do that? How does that happen? Anyone have any ideas? How, it says here, it says that the, the Antichrist, the little horn power, opposes the daily sacrifices. And the daily sacrifice in the New Testament is Jesus doing the work that we see here. Lighting the candle, helping us be lights of the world, opening the door of worship, applying the meaning of the Lamb and applying the power of the Lamb on the account of the Christian, answering prayer, being in awe of worship, celebrating the acceptance of Jesus. How does the little horn stop that? By deflecting. Little horn power set up a, 
a block so that the people wouldn't observe the mighty high priest Jesus Christ. So the historical books of Revelation, which is typically found in the first eight chapters, ten chapters, mainly dealing with the daily, have been blocked out. The rest of Revelation, the rest of Revelation is where, where, where Jesus makes the connections to see the power of the high priest. I was, I was when, I, when I saw this, I was like, it's amazing how, how Revelation has so many levels. And when we don't value the, the Old Testament, it's impossible to glean from Revelation the true meaning. I was, I was doing a little bit of research this week about Nazi Germany. Nazi Germany, they wrote, there was, there was a, kind of a thing that came up in the Nazi Germany part. It was called the German Christian Movement or German Christians. And they reinterpreted, they threw out the Old Testament. They wanted to get everything Jewish out of Christianity. They threw away most of Paul's writings, most of the Gospels they threw out. They kept, they kept a hybrid Gospel. And they didn't want anything to do with the Old Testament. You take away the Old Testament, how in the world are you going to understand Revelation? How in the world are you going to understand these things? And so I was simply amazed at seeing the level of the sanctuary service in the book of Revelation. The more we understand the sanctuary, the more we're going to understand and appreciate Jesus Christ. Those last parts, he's still preparing a place. Revelation, or John 14. John chapter 14, 1 through 3. This, this verse is absolutely stunning. John 14, 1 through 3. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not, if it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. I believe what Jesus is doing in Revelation is what makes this promise come true. For example, how long do you think it takes the Creator to prepare heaven for us to come? At slowest, six days. If you need to make mansions or dwelling places, how, how fast could Jesus make heaven? If you need to make uh, the Connor family beds, how fast? Would he, get, would he get it right the first time? Would Jake be, no, that's not right. No, it would be perfect. It would be perfect. So, when he says, I'm preparing a place for you, I don't think it's about, it, it takes 2,000 years to make heaven. Of course not. Let's go to, let's, let's, I think Jesus had a verse in mind when he, when he said this. A lot of sayings that Jesus had, he had a lot of verses in mind. Let's go to Exodus 23. I think he was, he had this thought in mind. Exodus 23, verse 20. In the context is the sanctuary and the services, the annual feasts. And he says, Behold, in verse 20 of Exodus 23, Behold, I send an angel before you to keep you in the way and to bring you into the place which I have prepared. So we have this similar context. God's talking to Moses and says, I'm going to send an angel before you. And who is this angel? It's Jesus. Send this angel, see it's capital angel, before you to keep you in the way, to bring you into the place. What's the place? Promised land that I've prepared for you. 
But there was something, there was, there, there was, there was something, there's a promise made. He makes it in Exodus 23, 20, and he makes it in John 14, verse 3. He makes a promise about a place. And in the Old Testament, the place was the promised land. And in the New Testament, the place is heavenly Canaan or New Jerusalem or, or um, heaven. But how does the preparation go? In Exodus 23, verse 20, the preparation, if they followed the preparation, if they followed something, it would, have, it would have caused them to be ready to enter Canaan. But what was the problem? They didn't follow the guidebook. The guidebook for them was if they were, had a heart that was ready to follow the sanctuary and the sanctuary meaning, they would have been ready to accept the promised land. But that first generation said, no, we do things our own way. Revelation, every part of Revelation is satura saturated with sanctuary language. Every part. For 2,000 years, the liturgy of Revelation is the history of Christianity. If Christians, if Adventist Christians want to be ready for heaven, we're going to follow what He has laid down for us in the sanctuary. Adjustments. Little Eva, we started to prepare a place for her before she, she came. But there was one thing that had to happen, one thing that needed to happen before she could go in her nursery. It's the same thing with us. There's something that needs to happen before we can go into the heavenly nursery. Eva needed to be born. Big adjustments for her. We took her to the doctor, and I asked about, what you know, new parents? What is this? It's a rash. And the doctor said, it's a big fancy word. Many syllables, and I decided to quit after four. And, what is it? and she said, that is a rash of being allergic to the world. Because she was, she was in, this, in this warm, dark room. She had all, everything she needed. 51 hours of adjustments my wife made. Eva was born. I wonder... If there's anybody here or across the street that needs to be reborn, because you're comfortable in the world, you have everything you need, but you feel empty inside. And you think about what, if Jesus comes back soon, I don't think I'm ready. Now, I'm not talking about the, the, some of us, we contemplate, we think about Jesus, and, and we, we wonder if, I, if I'm going to make it or not. I'm not talking about necessarily, I'm talking about you know that you've never really wanted to follow Jesus, or you made a decision to follow Jesus long ago, but you've just drifted back into the comfortable setting of the world. And you feel like you've put Jesus way on the back burner and nearly forgot him, that if, that if death happens or Jesus comes back, you would not make it. That's the first adjustment that needs to take place. You need to answer the call. Some of you, you know about this truth in Seventh-day Adventism. You understand about the Sabbath. You understand that God's calling you to keep Sabbath. It's written in stone. It's written by a finger of love. It's been died by a Savior who, who spilled His blood so that you could follow in love. Some adjustments need to be made to your schedule. Sabbath is for mankind. It's for you. In Christianity, there needs to be adjustments. 
Who's in charge of that holy time? Are you? Is your business or is God? Adjustments. Some adjustments are uncomfortable. Some adjustments we don't want to face, just like the belt that we talked about. Some adjustments are necessary. Are you willing to live with, with God? Throughout Christianity, the big picture, Christianity has made many adjustments. Think about your life. Think about how you lived. Many adjustments. You have to make many adjustments. Same thing with your walk with Jesus. Do you spend time with with Jesus every morning? Adjustments need to be made. If you think you can only survive on getting a little here and a little there from other people, it's going to be very difficult. when major adjustments take place in the end of days. If you're living on cruise control and week by week go by and you haven't really ever embraced the whole idea of sharing Jesus with your neighbors and family members, adjustments need to be made. Remember, this is what Jesus promises. Never feel that Christ is far away. He is always near. His loving presence surrounds you. Seek Him as one who desires to be found of you. He desires, he desires you not only to touch His garments, but to walk with Him in constant communion. It's a very good book, Ministry of Healing, page 85. He promises to be with us at every adjustment we need to make. Some of you need to make Sabbath adjustments. Some of you need to make morning adjustments so you can have devotions. Some of you, some of you need to make adjustments so that you can accept Jesus with all your heart. Some of you need to make adjustments where you need to, God, I, I've been here for a while. It's time that I accept that the truth in Adventism and become an Adventist. Some of you need to make these adjustments. What's keeping you from making the adjustments that God is putting on your heart right now? Some of you need to make adjustments because you just haven't taken seriously the truth of Adventism. And there's many people in your family, there's many people around your neighborhood that when the end comes, They'll raise up their voice and say, why so-and-so? Why didn't you share what you've known all along? Make these adjustments now so that you can live faithful in Christ Jesus today and tomorrow. And maybe I didn't hit what adjustments you need to make, but believe me, we're not where we need to be as a church. Some of you probably need to make some health adjustments. One thing that we need to remember, don't buy the lie that our spiritual life has no connection to our physical bodies. That's been embraced in Christianity, and it's a heresy. We are body, mind, and spirit. All of it affects all of it. Make the adjustments to be more faithful this week than you were last week. It's a constant climb. That's what sanctification is. The sanctuary is a celebration of sanctification. It's a celebration of justification. And it's a celebration of glorification. Let's pray that whatever God is asking you to do, you're willing to adjust the belt of truth around your, your waist.
so you can fit what God wants you to live by. Let's pray. Father, you've promised that you'll always be with us. The fact that you were with John in 95 was, was to help the church to adjust to different times. You have shown that in the past how they used to worship is what you're doing in heaven today. And you've, you've given us evidence that, Lord, you have a place for us, but the preparation is in our hearts. Because you can make things in a moment, but you're so patient. Lord, help me to make the adjustments to be the father I need to be, the pastor that you want me to be, the spouse that I, that I really need to be. And Lord, help us to be faithful in Christ Jesus, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Please join us in standing as we sing our closing hymn, 626, in a little while we're going home. you're wearing a belt and you change and you make an adjustment, may that be a reminder what adjustments does Jesus want to make in your life? If you're not wearing a belt, pretend that you are. 
Because what matters most is that we make the adjustments that Jesus is putting on our heart. Some of you have been convicted by what I said in the past, just end of my sermon about adjustments. There's two options that can be done. You can ignore those adjustments and all may be well for a while. And you may have some sort of apparent peace. But the second time, God speaks a little bit louder. But it's easier to ignore His voice when you start denying what He wants you to do. He will speak even louder. But you have already set a pattern that it's even easier to deny His voice. You may have realized that maybe you're in a pattern of Him speaking louder and getting your attention, but it's becoming more and more easy to wish those thoughts away. So when you pick up a belt or put one on, God, we give you permission to bring back what adjustments we need to make. Let's pray. Father, throughout the ages of your interplay with humanity, you've been asking us to follow your lead. For Abraham, huge adjustments. Leave your father's house and go to a land that I show you. Noah, build a boat. Big adjustments. John the Baptist, preach like you've never preached before about Jesus. Cedar Lake Church, everybody's at a different place. Lord, help us to be faithful as we leave this sanctuary because you're here. May we leave with the idea, Lord, I will make the adjustments that you're putting on my heart today. Whatever it is, help me not to forget it. Lord, through the Spirit of God, don't let me drop these ideas. Don't let me wish them away. Lord, be aggressive because it's about being close to you. And we don't know better sometimes. And Father, we ask as we leave, we would have hearts recreated, remade that want to follow. That's a miracle. Thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.